You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. It consists of a series of presentations by experts in allergy immunology and can serve as the didactic curriculum for trainees in the field. I hope you enjoy COLA. Yeah, we see it. Yep. Okay. So thank you. Um, This is our third in our 2022 COLA orientation series. I guess we have been doing an orientation series all along, so it's not really the third, but it's the third one I've been involved with. And uh, it's a different kind of presentation because the idea is that it's very clinically oriented. There's more anecdote than anything else. There's a lot of personal opinion. I'm not going to show you data. I'm not going to quote practice guidelines. I want it to be more of an interactive discussion type of thing about how we actually diagnose and manage food allergy. Normally, I've been co-presenting this with Dr. Pandya. She's in allergy clinic today, so she's not available. Uh, So I need allergy fellows to be ready to answer questions and uh, participate because having an interactive dialogue really does help. Uh, Here are my disclosures, and here are the learning objectives. And I'd like to start out by just asking a series of questions. When we Usually when you see a talk on food allergy, it shows IgE, non-IgE, it gives you classifications, it talks about all the statistics and the demographics and all of that stuff. That's not what you do in clinic. In clinic, a patient comes in and wants to know, is this a food allergy? So let's start with that. Let's say we've got an eight-month-old who occasionally vomits after drinking a full bottle of infant formula, but is otherwise happy and growing normally. Is this food allergy? Dr. Anderson, do you think that's food allergy? Are you there? She just let us know that she had to return a page. Um, so I will answer for Why Melissa. don't you? Anybody can answer. Yeah, please. I don't think it's a food allergy. It sounds just like a happy reflux baby. So. You think the kid has spit up? Yes. So spit up is a, is a terrible name because it sort of sounds like a little spit. In fact, spitting up means you vomit like a fountain all over. Parents don't know that. They think spit up means just spit. And so when they see the fountain coming out, they think something is wrong. They call it projectile vomiting. Projectile vomiting is just spit up. That's being called something else. It's a euphemism. It sounds nicer than vomiting all over the place. Um, So this is a normal child. If he's growing well, that means whatever is staying in is enough to help him grow. He does not have food allergy. What about an 18-month-old who vomits repeatedly, turns pale and lethargic about three hours after eating rice cereal, but no other symptoms? What do you think that? Does that kid have food allergy? Just just Um, so that we go go ahead. uh, I was going to say to me, it doesn't sound necessarily like, it sounds more like F-PIES, which is non-IGE mediated. But Mm -hmm. that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's what I was going for is food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome, uh, which I love to say when I say it in front of parents, they're really impressed that I can that I know what that is because their doctors had never heard of it. Um, It's very common. Usually the patient's done it two or three times because the parents can't quite connect eating the food with having the reaction. But after it's happened two or three times, they start to notice a connection between the food and the reaction. Sometimes they come in after having read about it and and know what it is. Other times they're totally mystified and have no idea what's going on. Um, The next one is a two-year-old with severe eczema that periodically flares up. Mother has blamed numerous foods for this, but can't figure out why the eczema is still there. This is a common problem that we see Uh, Eczema, food allergy is blamed for causing eczema. It's actually the opposite approach. Eczema causes food allergy. Food allergy does not cause eczema. Uh, In most cases, eczema is not triggered by food. But when the parents see the eczema going up and down, they try to find a food to blame because otherwise they have no control over it. And so, but it's very frustrating because they can't identify a particular food that does it. 
Um, and then the last one is a three-year-old who reproducibly gener develops generalized hives, wheezing, and then vomits shortly after eating peanut butter. I put this one in here because this is food allergy. Okay. If you want to recognize a pattern, so when the patient comes in and you know when it's food allergy or not, the last one is food allergy. The other ones are not. Okay. Here's a six-month-old. This one we see, I see every day. Well, every at least a couple times a week. Six-month-old who eats peanut butter for the maybe for the first time shortly afterwards, develop this rash on his face. The rash is only slightly itchy. It lasts a few hours, then resolves. No other symptoms. Is this food allergy? And what should you do about this? Any of the fellows? Yeah, this is a tough one, isn't it? We see it every day, don't we? <clears throat> Parents come in, rash, mm -hmm. after eating guess, peanut. Yeah, yeah I go guess ahead. Based off of what you're like, what the case is showing in the picture, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a food allergy. Like it could be dermatitis or the picture's a little blurry for me, but I'm not sure if it's a little bit of atopic dermatitis too. But it just comes and lasts for a few hours and goes away. Atopic derm mm -hmm. would be persistent. Yeah, wouldn't, persistent. Wouldn't do that. Uh, it's slightly itchy. This is a very common food rash. Uh, a lot of foods will cause rashes around the mouth and on the face, probably from lymphatic absorption of the food. Uh, it's not, I mean, it could be IgE. It might not be IgE. It's not life-threatening or dangerous, but I, I see a lot of patients told you've got to avoid that food, get tested, go get treatment, get to the allergy office, and, you know, whole, whole rigmarole, and it causes tremendous anxiety. This is not something that should cause anxiety. In fact, I would, if my child had this, I would continue to feed them peanut as long as it's not really bothering them. Here's another one. This is the one you were referring to, a six-month-old with a history of this itchy rash. This is eczema. Rash gets worse a few hours after egg is ingested. Uh, so this patient has eczema that's being triggered by foods. Uh, it's hours later. It doesn't happen immediately because it's a type 4 reaction. Uh, allergy testing has no connection to this at all, but we still call it food allergy, even though it's eczema, it's not IgE mediated, uh, has nothing to do with IgE, there's no anaphylaxis potential, but the, but it's called food allergy anyway. It's, you see how confusing this whole thing is. Our terminology is terrible. Uh, oh, I saw this patient. This is actually an image off the internet, but I saw a patient exactly like this. This is a two-year-old who ate fruit-flavored candy and developed this rash. The rash was unilateral, repeatable, no other symptoms. Um, this kid actually has Fry syndrome, which is a, a neurologic uh, abnormality usually caused by forceps delivery. The nerve is injured, and so when tart foods are eaten, the glossal nerve, which is responsible for salivation, triggers vasodilation in the cheeks, and you get this kind of red pattern. Uh, in adults, it can be a real problem. In kids, it usually resolves over time. It's not a food allergy, but it definitely happens right after you eat a food. And it can parents get terrified when they see rashes, so they 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 rush right into the doctor, and the doctor doesn't know what it is, so tells them it's a food allergy, does tests, and scares them to death, and it goes down that path. What is that I, syndrome I, called again, Dr. Portman? Say what? What was that Go syndrome ahead. called again for that last one? It's called Fry syndrome, F-R-E-Y syndrome. Perfect. I should have put that down. You can look it up. It's a very common, it's not a real common thing, but I have seen it occasionally. Um, I guess my point is food allergy isn't that clearly defined. We all, we all think we know what it is. We really don't know what it is. Um, from a parent or patient perspective, any unwanted symptom that does not have an obvious cause is often blamed on a food. So if they get a rash, if they get stomach ache, if they get constipation or diarrhea, they have behavior problems, runny, stuffy nose, autism, all kinds of things, parents for some reason want to find a food that's causing it. Can't possibly be something else. Um, so from a patient perspective, um, anything that is unwanted, not necessarily even related to eating, is blamed on food because that's all the rage right now. Uh, allergy tests do not help this. And in some cases, the test will be positive and then that can be misleading because it's not actually the food causing the problem, even though the test is elevated. Uh, but the parents think that the test being elevated proves that it is the food. And so it can be very misleading. Don't do testing in these kinds of patients. But medically, 
Uh, IgE mediated reactions after ingestion of a food um, often occur uh, and are manifested by hives, wheezing, stridor, vomiting, and basically anaphylaxis. Um, allergy tests may help in this case because this is IgE mediated and allergy tests measure IgE. Uh, other types of reactions are usually called food intolerance. Uh, they are often uh, kind of mislabeled as food allergy anyway because it's very confusing and we like to use the word food allergy, but things like food poisoning, scombroid poisoning where the food has histamine in it, uh, pharmacologic reactions, intolerance such as lactose intolerance, even the eczema that's being triggered by a food. Do you call that a food allergy or not? It's not mediated by IgE but it is a type four hypersensitivity reaction to a food, what do we call it? Uh, our nomenclature is not very clear. All I can say is that allergy tests did not help in this situation. Food allergy prevalence has been increasing over time. For peanut, here it says 0.8%. In general, it's about 1.5% overall if you don't stick only with double blind challenges. Um, so it's between one and 2% prevalence for the most common foods, which is milk, egg, peanut, um, probably they, they say wheat. I, I haven't seen very much wheat allergy. And tree nuts is often associated with peanut allergy, although it's not quite as common. Uh, the prevalence of peanut allergy has been increasing. That's because we delayed introduction uh, in the early 2000s, and early delayed introduction of peanut causes peanut allergy uh, in kids who have eczema. So early introduction is really important. So when I have a patient who comes in with a concern about peanut allergy, um, the clinical history of food allergy is something you have to get in order to determine how probable you think it is that the patient actually has food allergy. So these are the questions that I ask when a patient comes in. I ask, has the food of concern ever been eaten? Did your child ever eat this food? If they never ate the food, why are they concerned about it? What, what led to that concern? It's often it's the, the dad has an allergy to shellfish, so I'm worried that my kid's going to have it, something like that, or I read about it, or my neighbor has it, who, who knows? The bottom line is the food has to be eaten to cause anaphylaxis. A uh, history of ingestion determines the pretest probability of anaphylaxis. If they say they've eaten the food and had a reaction, then you know that there's a very high probability the foods, that they have food allergy. If they ate the food and never had a reaction, probably not. But if they've never eaten the food, you shouldn't really be asking the question because kids really, we don't have any reason to think there is a food allergy. In terms of what food was eaten and how much, uh, food reactions are often dose dependent. A little bit of the food will cause a very mild or no reaction. A whole bunch of the food can cause a more severe reaction. The parents often want to know if the amount of IgE determines how severe the reaction will be. No, it has no connection at all. It's just connected to how probable it is that there will be a reaction. The severity of the reaction is related to how much food you eat. Was this the first ingestion? And has the food been eaten since then? Uh, reaction can occur after the first ingestion. I, when I was a fellow, I was taught that you had to have eaten the food first to get exposure, and then subsequently you can have a reaction. Kids react on the first ingestion. Um, we, we now know that this happens because they absorb food allergens through their skin because they have eczema. Skin's permeable, they absorb food allergens because house dust is loaded with food allergens and that's what sensitizes them. It may take several ingestions before the parent realizes that the food's a problem. A lot of times they'll feed the kid a food and they'll have a reaction and they're not, they don't really connect that together. And then they feed it several times and then they, they notice a pattern. And at that point, then they realize that the food really is a problem. Uh, if the food ha has been tolerated subsequently, kid does not have food allergy. Uh, I have actually seen patients who um, they thought that it was a reaction to peanut. The doctor did a blood test. It was elevated. Subsequently, the patient ate, ate peanut M&Ms, did not have a reaction. They come in to see what to do about that. What I tell them is eat some more peanut M&Ms. They're delicious. There's no reason to avoid it because you're not allergic to peanuts. If you've tolerated it subsequently, food allergies rolled out. Now, the clinical history does help to set the pretest probability. So I, I ask other questions. How long after ingestion until the reaction? Food allergies usually happen fast, one to 30 minutes. 
Um, alpha gal is one exception. It's an allergy to mammal meat. It's a sugar in mammal meat. You can have a delayed reaction of three to four hours. That's because it's bound to the protein and the protein has to be digested be to release the alpha gal before you can react to it. It takes a few hours to do that. Uh, delayed reactions are often a sign of an intolerance like f pies or lactose intolerance, as opposed to an IgE reaction, which happens fast. So that's how you can tell the likelihood that it's an IgE reaction by how quickly after ingestion till the reaction occurs. Uh, the duration of symptoms depends on how much you eat. Um, if you eat a little bit of peanut, it's in your gut, it gets absorbed, and then it's done. If you eat a whole bunch of peanut, it might sit in your gut for a while, slowly being absorbed, and then the reaction will be prolonged. How much you eat determines how long the reaction takes place. And then the manifestations, you, you, the main thing I worry about is respiratory, GI, and cardiovascular. Anything that could be life-threatening uh, is something that I worry about. If a patient has an itchy mouth, hives, rash on their face, really not too worried about it. They're scary to the parents. The parents are terrified about this. They really don't harm the child, and there's not, it's not actually a reason that you have to avoid the food. In fact, this is a child I would encourage the parents to continue to feed the food because over time it may reduce the likelihood of developing food allergy. Uh, but parents are terrified of this. Doctors don't know what to do with it. They do blood tests, scare the parents, give them epinephrine, and you end up with uh, having to deal with food allergy. Um, and here's the most important thing. If there are no symptoms following ingestion, the patient does not have food allergy. Sounds like common sense. I can't tell you how many patients come in and the doctor did a blood test. It was elevated. The patient was eating the food. They were told to stop eating the food because the test was elevated. But they were eating the food without a reaction. They're not allergic to food allergy. They shouldn't have even done the test. But it happens all the time. So this is what I ask about when they come in. I ask how long did the reaction last? Uh, what treatment was given and did it help? So did they use epinephrine? Did they take an antihistamine? Did they do any treatment? Did the treatment make any difference? Um, were any tests done? Uh, parents come in and they want me to tell them about their child's food allergy. And a lot of times they will say that their doctor did a blood test and they want me to comment on the blood test results but they rarely bring the test with them. The doctors often don't share it with the patients. They just call them on the phone and tell them, which is why I think calling patients on the telephone is the worst way to communicate information. And many patients will look for symptoms to support the test results. A lot of times they will say, well, yeah, we had the test done. It was a little bit high to paint to milk and egg and so on. And then I started to notice that whenever we drank milk, he acted a little fussy or something. They will start to look for symptoms that support the test results, even though they didn't have the symptoms before the test was done. So it's important to ask the question, when did your child start having these symptoms? Was it before the test was done or was it because the test was done that they started having the symptoms? Uh, I also ask, were any tests done for foods that have not been ingested? Um, food panels lead to that. Lots of tests are done for foods. Patients never eaten that food before. They're not even concerned about it. Test comes back positive now, they're worried about that food. Uh, you shouldn't do a panel, um, but they often are used. And some physicians think that you have to order panels. You no, know, you order individual foods that are of concern. I ask parents if they have epinephrine and if they know how to use it. They may not need it. I might not think that this patient has food allergy. There's no risk for anaphylaxis. They don't need epinephrine, but if they already have it, um, then they should know how to use it and when to use it anyway. Um, I, I usually teach them that and make sure they go over it, even though I tell them I really don't think you need it. Um, but a lot of outside doctors in particular are very quick to prescribe epinephrine auto-injectors. By the way, the fact that you've prescribed an auto-injector is scares the patients. Then they're, you're telling them that the that their child is at risk of dying and they need epinephrine. So the mere fact of prescribing it uh, actually creates tremendous anxiety among parents. It doesn't necessarily make them feel more comforted. And I ask if they have a written action plan. In many cases, they were given a prescription, went to the pharmacy where they were told how to use it. But they have no idea when to use it or what to do if they do use it. Um, written action plan is important, but often are not given to patients. This is a very common problem, hidden food allergies. 
patients with a history of hives, eczema, behavior changes, or other nonspecific symptoms will often look at, for a food as a cause. Uh, the food may not be the cause, it almost certainly is not, but they think there's a hidden food allergy. Uh, this is actually a cognitive bias called confirmatory evidence bias. Uh, they look for evidence to support it every time he drinks milk. Well, yeah, I guess he does act a little fussy. They start looking for evidence to support their belief that a food is causing whatever problem their child has, even though the food actually isn't the cause. Um, my point is real food allergies are generally obvious. Child parent comes in, my child ate peanut, developed hives, couldn't breathe, peanut allergy. Hidden food allergies don't exist. Parents who have, patients who have food allergy come in and they tell you what food caused what symptom. If they come in and they wanna know, is there a food allergy because he's got these vague symptoms? It's not a food allergy. Uh, fictitious food allergies are often hidden. They, my child acts up, eczema flares, hive gets worse. I can't figure out what food causes it. They, they assume that it's a food, even though the food has nothing to do with it. Um, one time you got hives after eating pizza. Was it the pizza? Can you do a pizza test? I, I have this request all the time. Parents want me to do tests for foods that probably aren't causing any problem at all, but they want an explanation and it must be a food because they can't think of anything else to explain what they're observing. Uh, if the patient or parent suspects that a hidden or unknown food is the cause of their symptoms, the bottom line is it's not a food allergy. It never is. Okay, we do a lot of tests for food allergies. There's a tremendous amount of literature written about allergy tests. Uh, I guess my, my question is, why do we do tests? Um, you know, one reason is to confirm the diagnosis when it's uncertain. If the patient ate several foods and they had a reaction, is it one of those foods? You're not really sure which food it is. It confirms the diagnosis, defines the mechanism as IgE-mediated or not IgE-mediated. Uh, you can use a test to monitor disease activity over time. So if we measure it once a year and see if the IgE is going down, it kind of gives you an idea of whether the food allergy is in the process of resolving, and you can use that to estimate a prognosis. In terms of which foods to test for, food suspected to have caused a reaction is what you test for. I think that my child ate peanut and he had a reaction, you test for peanut. You don't test for shellfish or do food panels or any of that stuff. Foods that the parent or patient believes they may be allergic to, you know, well, I'm not sure. I'm just concerned that maybe, you know, the uncle has a food allergy and I want you to test for all these things. It's a lot more questionable whether you should actually do a test for that or not. I, I generally don't, but I, at least I try to talk the parents out of making me order it for them because a lot of times they just demand it. You end up having to do it. Uh, and food panels should not be ordered unless it's a logical panel, like we do tree nuts because oftentimes they go together, there's cross reactivity. So tree nut panel may, does make some sense. But really, why do we do a test? It's done if the result has a potential to change the treatment. If doing the test isn't gonna make any difference, you know, you're know, you not gonna change any treatment, don't, no reason to do the test. If the treatment won't change, don't do it. A patient who can eat a food without a reaction is not allergic to that food. They don't need a test. I, I have parents who come in all the time and they say, my child eats this food, but I'm worried about food allergies, so I want you to test them for it. And there's no reason to do that. They're not allergic. The test might be elevated. They're still not allergic. Do not order food panels that contain foods that are not of concern. The goal is to determine the likelihood that it is safe to eat the food. That's what you're trying to determine. repeating over and over again, and yet we tend to forget it. So you do a test for a food allergy if it's gonna change your treatment. If the probability of peanut allergy is really low, um, don't do a test, um, just eat the peanut. If the probability is really high, avoid peanut, carry epinephrine, maybe offer oral immunotherapy. You don't necessarily need a test unless you're going to use the result to monitor activity over time. On the other hand, if you're not really sure, it's close to the threshold where a test might actually change your decision because you're not sure if they have an allergy, then it might be worthwhile to do a test. So what test should we do? Um, well, 
Uh, history of ingestion is the most important test. That we don't think of that as a test, but it is a test. If the patient can eat the food, they don't have food allergy. If the patient consistently has a systemic reaction after eating the food, they have food allergy. The mechanism doesn't matter. I don't care if it's IgE or anything else. If they can't eat the food, don't eat the food. Um, if the patient has never eaten the food, why are we worried about it? You shouldn't be worried about food allergy unless some doctor did a blood test. Um, so, and then you don't have to do your own test. It's already been done. Um, there are two tests that we often do, PRIC and in vitro tests. And there's a lot of controversy over which one should be done. Should you do a PRIC test? Do you do a blood test? What do you do? Um, and it, it, there's still some controversy about that. Uh, let me just talk about PRIC tests for foods. Um, several uh, issues related to them. Uh, antihistamines, of course, interfere with them. Skin tests should not be done if the patient has dermographia. Uh, I see a lot of patients with really sensitive dermographic skin and uh, allergists outside will do skin tests and everything's positive and then the patient's told you're allergic to all these foods. It's nonsense. If they have dermographia, don't do a skin test, please. And we generally don't recommend intradermal skin tests for foods. There's just no, uh, no reason to do that. Um, this is uh, from a study that John Oppenheimer did. Uh, um, they took a number of nurses and did different skin, did the same skin tests on the same patient, uh, and they determined the coefficient of variance. And it's actually pretty high. Um, it ranges everywhere from 55, from 16 up to 55 percent. That's the uh, standard deviation divided by the mean is the coefficient of variance. And what that means is that in many cases, you aren't going to be able to determine whether it's a positive or negative test if it's kind of an in-between reaction. If it's totally negative, you can tell. If it's totally positive, you can tell. But if it's close to the threshold, you really can't discriminate a positive from a negative, which doesn't make the skin test a very useful test for monitoring activity over time. It's useful for getting a quick read on is the patient allergic or not, but that's to that food, but that's it. I don't, I don't think of it as quantitative at all. Um, and, but even so, Sporic did publish these numbers, eight millimeters uh, for cow's milk. It gives you 95% pr predictive value. Uh, I would question that. What, what if it's seven millimeters? Are they not going to react to the food? If it's nine millimeters, are they going to react to the food? Anytime you see a cutoff like this, and above it, you have the disease and below it, you don't have the disease. That, that makes no sense. And that's not actually what Sporic is saying. He's saying that you have a greater than 95% chance if you have that side of a size of a wheel. Um, but that doesn't take into account the pretest probability or any of a number of other factors. So this is problematic. Um, we do have blood tests. This is the machine at Children's Mercy Hospital. Um, the way this is the immunocap machine, it's an automated fluorescent uh, immunoassay. Um, the way it works is you bind allergens to the solid phase right here. Uh, patient IgE is added. Uh, then a conjugated anti-IgE is added after washing the unbound patient IgE away. And then you wash away the unbound conjugated anti-IgE and add a fluorescent substrate. The amount of fluorescence is proportional to how much antibody binds to the solid phase. Um, so it's it's actually very uh, very um, mature technology, um, and these are some values that have been developed for those um, using from Samson. Uh, and again, I, I have a problem with um, thresholds greater than seven. Um, there's a 95% positive predictive value, um, but that doesn't really tell me what if it's a six. What if it's a five? What I mean, it's just not. I don't find it to be that that helpful. Uh, and this is a this is a curve that is frequently shown. Uh, if you have very low IgE, then your probability of reaction is very low. If you have a very high IgE, then your probability of reaction is high. Uh, and I wrote that this is wrong. This is absolutely wrong. And that's because if the patient has eaten peanut and their IgE is zero, we say, well, it's, it's a false. If they've had a reaction to peanut and the IgE is zero, we say it's a false negative. It's not a false negative. The test is what it is. Tests measure what they measure and they tell you probabilities. They don't tell you how probable the disease is. They tell you how much your pretest probability changes given the test results. And if you look at it that way, it makes a lot more sense. This is really not very 
helpful. We, you know, patient who uh, eats a food and has no reaction, but their IgE is 100. It's very high probability, but we know that it's zero. So how can this be right? It's, it's not right. What we instead need to do is to look at peanut-specific IgE or food-specific IgE and compare and use that to determine the likelihood ratio. And the likelihood ratio tells you how much more or less probable it is that the patient has the, the disease given the test results. Let me, let me show you with that. Oh, this is an ROC curve for egg, showing that we've got egg and peanut results. Basically, we want to know what is the probability of food allergy. It can be anywhere from zero to 100%. Our pretest probability, if we have no information, uh, is the prevalence in the population. For peanut allergy, it's 1.5%. Um, we want to know something more so we can add, get a history and ask, do you have peanut allergy? Have you had a reaction or not? If they've never had a reaction, the probability goes way down. If the patient had, says, yes, I ate peanut and such and such happened, then it's more likely that the patient has peanut allergy and the disease probability is increased. If, the, uh, if you do an allergy test, you can get even more information. So if the allergy test is negative, then it becomes less likely that the patient actually has peanut allergy. If the test is positive, then the probability increases yet again. So what the test does is it helps you to change the pretest probability into a post-test probability. It doesn't tell you what the probability of the disease is. It tells you how much the test probability changes. It's a very hard concept to get across. You've got to think like a Bayesian because this is Bayesian logic. And you can use likelihood ratios using this Fagan nomogram on the left. Um, which I find to be pretty complicated and tedious, or McGee came up with a simplified approach. Uh, this tells you, given a certain likelihood ratio, how much of a change in the disease probability can you expect to observe? If the likelihood ratio is one, there's no change. If the likelihood ratio is very small, 0.1, there's a 45% lower likelihood that the patient actually has the disease. If the likelihood ratio is 10, which is pretty high likelihood ratio, the probability of the disease goes up by 45%. So using this curve here, you can get a pretty good estimate of how much more or less likely the patient is to have a food allergy if you know what the likelihood ratio is for the test result. Uh, and I'm, I think we need to see more likelihood ratios in our lab reports rather than values, because values I think are worthless. We need to know what the likelihood ratio is for that value. Here's an example of how we would use this. Here's a decision tree for food allergy. Uh, here's the history, no reaction. So the risk, I'm, I'm just, these numbers are sort of made up, but hypothetical for illustrative purposes. If the patient has never, has eaten the food and never react, did not react, their risk is really low. They're probably not allergic to food allergy. If we do an IgE test and we get these values and I've plugged in the values for peanut allergy, um, the post-test probability is still really low. Uh, it doesn't matter what the IgE test is, the recommendation is still eat the food. So there was no reason to do the test because if the patient had no reaction, you're still gonna tell them to eat the food regardless of the test results. If the patient ate the food and had, an, had anaphylaxis, they're very high risk of having anaphylaxis if they eat that food because you've got that history. Uh, in that case, even if the IgE is less than 0.1, your new probability is only is still 38%, which is pretty high. So the pretest probability clearly has a strong influence on the post-test probability. The recommendation will still be to avoid the food regardless of the test results. Why do the test? If the patient has never eaten the food, that's when you really don't know what's going on. The initial risk is 1.5%. If somebody does a blood test now, then you're not really, then this is what happens. Um, if, it's, if it's a low blood test, your recommendation is to eat the food. If it's a really high blood test, you might tell them to avoid the food. But if it's intermediate, you don't really know what to tell them. So then we need a more definitive test, such as an oral challenge. So here's my question. How probable does the risk of anaphylaxis need to be to tell the patient they should avoid the food? Uh, for peanut, the prevalence is 1.5. That's just the prevalence of food allergy in the general population. So if the risk is 1.5 or less, people eat peanut. We don't do oral challenges or blood tests on everybody before they eat a peanut. Uh, we know that there's a 1.5% 
chance they'll have a reaction. Um, so, but people are just told to eat the peanut anyway, because that's the way it is. So we know that if it's 1.5% or less, um, eat the peanut. But what if the risk is greater? What if you've done a test and the test or the history suggests a higher probability that there will be a systemic reaction? Um, this really depends on how risk averse the family is. Some families are perfectly happy to try reintroducing the food at home, even if the risk is five or 10%. Uh, they, they gave their child peanut, they got a rash on their face, the doctor did a blood test, the peanut Ig was elevated, but it was a rash on their face. We already know what the reaction is. Uh, the families are happy to try it again. And if the kid just gets a rash on their face, they can continue to feed peanut and maybe it won't get any worse. Uh, other families are terrified of even mentioning the idea of mentioning that they could try it at home, regardless of the risk. They're just terrified. Uh, some of them even call and complain that the doctor said I should give my kid something at home and he's going to die from it. I mean, they get absolutely terrified of the, the mere idea of it. Uh, so families are very different. Uh, all, almost all families can share anecdotes about food allergy. They've heard that somebody ate a small amount and, and died from it. They heard that other people just outgrow their food allergy and it's not a problem. Uh, the cognitive bias is known as the availability bias. It's what you know about the thing, your preconceived notion of it um, before you actually have real information. Um, so families will come in with this and you need to find out how concerned they are before you can come up with a recommendation for uh, the likelihood that the, for what the patient should do. I, I like to use this, um, I think this is a great chart, that it basically tells you what happens to a person who has food allergy over time. What is the odds of different things happening? So uh, if we look at uh, emergency room avoidance, this is just how attendance. How often do normal people go to an emergency room? About one in two, one in three people who don't have food, just in the general population. Uh, emergency room attendance due to injury. If you get into a car accident, you have a one in 10 chance of that. Uh, death from any cause uh, in uh, the United States or Europe is about one in 100. Um, uh, death due to an accident or due to an accident in the United States or Europe, it's a little bit less likely. Uh, death to, due to homicide in the United States, it's pretty common, one in 10,000, a little bit more than that, a little bit less than that. Uh, death due to fire, death due to murder, um, and then death due to lightning strike, one in 10 million. So this kind of helps to calibrate how likely it is that these things are going to happen. Fatal food anaphylaxis in somebody who is known to have food allergy occurs in about one in a million. It's really, 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 really unlikely to happen. Parents are terrified. They're given epinephrine. They're told to carry two epinephrines. They're scared to death. The odds that their child will actually die from food allergy is one in a million. It's really, really unlikely. Um, so we're giving them epinephrine more to just comfort ourselves, to make us feel better. Um, this child's not going to actually die from anaphylax. Most people who eat a food that they're allergic to get a rash. They might throw up. They might even wheeze. They might get hives, but they don't die from it. It's really rare. Um, and, and I'm not pointing this out to say that we shouldn't take food allergy seriously or we shouldn't give up epinephrine, but we need to keep things in perspective. How bad is the food allergy really and how much of a risk is there to the patient? And I think it's important to think of it this way. Let's talk briefly about components. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Components are basically protein families. Um, if I take a peanut extract, that's not one thing. It's a whole bunch of different proteins from the peanut in the extract. And you can be allergic to different proteins. And depending on which protein you're sensitized to, there's a greater or lesser risk of having a systemic reaction. And that's because some of the proteins are labile and some of them are stable. Stable proteins tend to uh, stay in the gut and cause anaphylaxis, whereas labile proteins don't make it through the gauntlet of cooking the food, uh, eating the food, the acid and the enzymes in the intestine that digest the food. All of those things break down proteins and cause them not to trigger allergic reactions in, in labile proteins. Stable proteins, on the other hand, make it through the gauntlet to the gut and can cause a systemic reaction. So I have a number of anecdotes. These are just little stories. This is milk allergy. 
Uh, and we're going to look at some components. Nine month old with vomiting and hives after ingestion of milk. Sounds like this patient may have a milk allergy. Cow's milk IgE is 12.3, which is elevated. But if we look at the components, there's three, three components we commonly measure, alpha lactalbumin and beta lactoglobulin or heat labile, and then casein, which is heat stable. And we notice that the casein is very elevated. That's the stable protein. So even if you cook the food, you're still likely to have a reaction. Suggests a high likelihood of milk allergy. Then elevated IgE supports the likelihood, high likelihood of a reaction. And because the casein is high, the patient will probably not tolerate baked milk. If the casein was low, but the, uh, the others were high, then they would probably be able to tolerate baked milk, but not just plain milk. So uh, the recommendation would be to avoid milk, both cooked and uncooked, and monitor IgE annually. Egg components. Here's a one-year-old with no history of ingestion, has eczema. Um, this is a patient I wouldn't really necessarily do a test for, although if the parents want to know if he's become sensitized and should start early introduction, uh, since the patient has eczema, they are at increased risk of having an allergy to egg. Uh, in this case, the egg white IgE was 3.7, which is elevated. Um, the ovum mucoid is heat stable, but there's none of that. It's The IgE is all directed at ovalbumin, which is only partially heat labile. It's heat stable, partially stable. And so the elevated egg IgE suggests an increased risk of a reaction, about 5 to 10 percent, if you look at the likelihood ratio. Uh, the low ovum mucoid suggests that they can eat fully cooked egg, but not partially cooked egg, such as scrambled egg. So the recommendation is avoid partially cooked egg, monitor IgE annually, consider doing a baked egg challenge if they aren't eating baked egg. And finally, peanut. And I usually talk about Penny. She's eight months old and she's never eaten peanut. Um, and I'm gonna go through some very detailed scenarios here because this is this comes up all the time. Um, what is the likelihood that she has a peanut allergy if we know nothing more about her other than that she's eight months old? Uh, well, we know that the prevalence of peanut allergy is 1.5%. Therefore, she has a 1.5% chance of being allergic to peanut. Now, if if I tell you further that she has eczema and egg allergy, then how likely is it that she has peanut allergy? And in this case, we know this because the LEAP study actually measured it. Patients with eczema and egg allergy were enrolled in the LEAP study, and the prevalence of, egg al of peanut allergy in that population was 17%. So that's the prevalence um, if Penny has never eaten peanut, but she has egg allergy or, or eczema. Now, let's assume that we that she doesn't have eczema or egg allergy. Her probability is 1.5%. If her peanut IgE is less than 0.1 and she has a negative skin test, the likelihood that she has peanut allergy is less than 1.5% because the likelihood ratio will be less than one. So we're decreasing the likelihood. The post-test probability is lower than the pre-test probability of peanut allergy. If she has a peanut-specific IgE greater than 100 and a positive skin test, then the likelihood is greater than 1.5% because the likelihood ratio will be greater than one. How much greater depends on how what the likelihood ratio is for the test results. In this case, an IgE greater than 100, the likelihood ratio is probably very high, and so the likelihood probability will be very high also. Okay. Let's say that we have a history. She ate peanut did not have a reaction. She has peanut-specific IgE less than 0.1 negative skin test. The likelihood is zero, basically, much, much less than 1.5%. She ate peanut, no reaction, negative skin test, no, no peanut allergy. If she has a peanut-specific IgE greater than 100 and a positive skin test, the likelihood, uh, given the peanut tolerance, the likelihood will still be less than 1.5%, regardless of the test results. You should never do the test. The test is just misleading. What it does is it scares the patient or the parents because the Ig is really high, but the patient's eating the food without a reaction. They're not allergic to the food. There was no reason to do the test. Now that you've done the test, you've scared them to death. They probably could still eat the food though. They're very unlikely to have a reaction to it. If she ate peanut and had anaphylaxis and her peanut IgE is less than 0.1 in a negative skin test, what is the likelihood that peanut that she has peanut allergy? Given this history of anaphylaxis, the likelihood is still really high. 
even if her test is negative, but she may be reacting because of other factors involved. It might not be an IgE mechanism, but if she has anaphylaxis after eating peanut, you have to avoid peanut. She's allergic to it. Doesn't matter what the test shows. The test isn't useful in that case. Uh, if her peanut IgE is greater than 100 and positive, then of course she's got peanut allergy. I'm hoping that this helps. This is just all of the different scenarios that you might run into with somebody who has peanut allergy. Sometimes we do oral challenges. We don't know if the patient, the test doesn't answer the question. There's always patient hasn't eaten the food. The IgE is still really is really high. Now the parents are scared to give the food. What do you do? So we can do an oral challenge. We do it to confirm the diagnosis of food allergy if we don't know that what they have, or to rule it out when we think it may have resolved or that the patient is unlikely to have it. Um, it can be either done open, single, or double blind with placebo controls. We pretty much always do open challenges. Uh, graded challenges can be done at 15 minute intervals, um, but um, for the most part, we just do two doses. So we give us 10th dose. You know, no, I'm thinking of drug allergy. Never, never mind. With, with food allergy, we actually do do the graded challenge. We start with a very small amount of the food, and at 15 minute intervals, we double the amount of the food up to a full meal's worth of that particular food, however much that is. If the patient uh, tolerates the food, they're not allergic to the food. If they have a reaction during the challenge, then we say that they're, they're allergic to the food and they should continue to avoid it. Here's where we get into trouble. This is what confuses people about food challenges. The goal of an oral challenge is to determine whether the food can safely, without anaphylaxis, be eaten. Okay, we want to know, is the patient going to die or have anaphylaxis if they eat the food? That's why we do an oral challenge. To do that, we have to finish with a full meal's worth of food. If the patient doesn't eat a full meal's worth of food, we don't know for sure whether they can eat that or not. If we abort the challenge prematurely, um, we, we aren't going to know that information. So we don't want to abort it unless the patient actually has a clear reaction that tells us that they can't eat the food. And so these are the issues. A lot of times during a food challenge, a patient will get a rash. And does a rash mean you have to stop the challenge? If you get a rash, a rash doesn't necessarily mean you can't eat the food. A lot of people eat foods and get rashes. And if it doesn't bother them too much and they really like the food, if, if, if I was allergic to chocolate and chocolate gave me a rash, I would eat the chocolate and just take a Benadryl or something and or try not to scratch too much but it's not life-threatening. The question is, is it dangerous to eat the food uh, or is it just causing a rash? Um, and if the rash is really uncomfortable, perhaps it's still a good reason to avoid the food, but it's not necessarily a reason to abort the food challenge if you want to really know whether the patient can safely eat the food. Another question is, should you avoid antihistamines before an oral challenge? This sort of depends on whether a rash is something you're worried about. Uh, if a patient has not has taken an antihistamine, they might not get the rash. They can eat the fool's meal's worth of food, and then we know that they can safely eat it. They, they still might get a rash when they eat it, but at least it's not going to kill them. And if they really want the food, they can eat it. On the other hand, if you want to know, is there any reaction, even including a rash, then they need to avoid the H1 antihistamine. Uh, you have to ask that question because in our section, we have this debate. Should they avoid the antihistamine? Should they take the antihistamine? It depends on what question you want to answer. If the question is, can the patient safely eat the food? The antihistamine should be given. If, the, if you want to know, is there even a rash? Can it, if not only can it safely be eaten, but will there be any reaction at all? Then, then you want to avoid the antihistamine. You have to ask what question are you trying to answer? And I would do that with the patient. How do the patient or the parents feel about the food? How eager are they to eat this food? And how worried are they if the child gets a rash? That, those are the questions I think have to be addressed. Food avoidance is not ca casual. Con for, first of all, food avoidance um, is not something you want to do casually because it really creates a huge hit on the patient's quality of life. Um, so I would point out the following facts. Casual contact with food will not cause anaphylaxis. You have to eat the food to have anaphylaxis. That's why it's called food allergy. Uh, skin contact with certain foods will commonly cause a rash. I see patients all the time. They, it's on their skin. They get a rash. That's why skin tests I don't think are that good either because skin tests will cause rashes, but the patient still doesn't react. 
Um, but um, certainly causes a local rash. That's not dangerous. Uh, that's just a rash. Just wipe it off, give an antihistamine. It's not a problem. Uh, patients do not need to avoid situations where they will come into casual contact, such as flights in which peanuts are served, baseball games, restaurants with peanut shells, that kind of stuff. Those things are not going to cause anaphylaxis. The patient can safely do those things. Uh, peanut oil does not have peanut allergen in it. It can safely be eaten. I can't tell you how many patients have avoided Chick-fil-A because it's in peanut oil. So and I tell them you can eat it, Chick-fil-A. The peanut oil is not the problem. And they're so grateful. Some parents don't believe me, but uh, the ones who do, they enjoy eating a Chick-fil-A again. Uh, and uh, produced in a factory that contains peanut, that makes peanut or whatever uh, on the label. That's a legal thing. The risk is still really low. They do everything they can to keep it out of it, um, but it's just there for legal purposes. So I tell patients not to worry about that. You could just tell them to avoid the food. Uh, of course, if they're on a restricted diet, there are a lot of consequences. It's not necessarily safe to avoid food. Uh, and if, if a patient's avoiding more than two or three foods, I always have them see a dietitian to make sure that they're not having uh, nutrition deficiencies. Okay, I'm almost done now. Uh, anaphylaxis, of course, is uh, patients who are at increased risk of anaphylaxis should be given an anaphylaxis action plan. It tells them when and, and, and how to use it. The treatment is epinephrine. Uh, now, there's all this, always this question, what about antihistamines? They may actually prevent progression to anaphylaxis, but they don't treat anaphylaxis once it has occurred. Our action plan says if you just have some a rash, but nothing more, technically that's not anaphylaxis. You can try an antihistamine. It may prevent progression, and then you don't need to use the epinephrine. Uh, but once you start having other symptoms, throwing up, wheezing, stuff like that, that's when you need to use epinephrine. Um, one of two other things, H2 blockers have no benefit, so giving them Pepsid is not necessary. And steroids have no benefit for anaphylaxis. So patient, it, not only does it not treat anaphylaxis, it doesn't reduce the risk of a late phase reaction either. There's no reason to give steroids to a patient who's having anaphylaxis. Here's our anaphylaxis plan. Um, everybody's got their own plan. Um, in my plan, I tell them to just observe if they've eaten the food but didn't have a, any symptoms. The most common way people find out they're not allergic to food is they accidentally eat it and nothing happens. If you treat it, then they won't know that nothing would happen because they'll assume that the treatment is why nothing happened. Uh, so just observe. If it's a mild reaction, usually you know, mostly just tinging, it, itching of the mouth or itching hives, things like that. Technically, this is not anaphylaxis. You can give an antihistamine and observe and see how they do. Maybe it'll just go away. Uh, once they have two or more systems, certainly if they're having trouble breathing or cardiovascular issues or wheezing, things like that, uh, then you use epinephrine. Um, and I always tell them to give epinephrine. I tell I don't tell them to give to call 911 right away. I, this is an old plan. I've made some modifications to the plan that I use. Uh, I think if they've used one dose of epinephrine, um, they can watch and see what happens. If the, if it controls it and nothing more occurs, then they're good to go. Uh, if they've used have to use a second epinephrine because 20 minutes later the reaction resumes, then they should call 911 because they're out of epinephrine. So they might need a third dose, so they should go get medical care. If you tell them to call 911 after they use one epinephrine and they do fine, the ambulance approach it comes, they go to the emergency room, they spend hours with all kinds of stuff being done that doesn't need to be done. And in the end, they end up with a six, $7,000 bill. I've had patients come in really angry because that happened. They really don't want to use, they don't want to call 911 unless they really need to. And I don't blame them. I, I don't like calling 911 either. We're not recommending Benadryl. We're recommending uh, Zyrtec or some other H1 blocker, but not the but not Benadryl. It's not a very effective antihistamine. And uh, epinephrine auto injector should be also indicated. So remember the diagnostic strategy. You determine the history test odds of the of the likelihood that the patient's allergic to peanut based on the symptoms following exposure or the prevalence if there's no history. You do a test for specific IgE, determine the likelihood ratio. It's not available for a lot of foods, but it's increasingly becoming available as more studies are looking into that. And test labs hopefully will start 
indicating what the likelihood ratio is for the value of IgE that is reported. Um, Post-test odds is the likelihood of having symptoms with exposure, and then you have to decide what to do. And the decision is eat the food, avoid the food and carry epinephrine and maybe oral immunotherapy if it's available, uh, or you may need to do an oral challenge if you're not sure. Um, so I use that as a segue leading into this idea of oral immunotherapy. This is now, I'm not gonna really talk about it very much except to mention that the FDA did approve Palforzia, which is the only brand of oral immunotherapy available right now, standardized peanut flour. What we do is we take patients uh, on day one and, and updose them to six milligrams of peanut flour, and then subsequently over 11 visits, updosing visits at two week intervals, uh, we increase them to 300 milligrams of peanut flour, which is one peanut. So if the patient, the idea is that if the patient can eat one peanut per day and not react, the odds are that they're not gonna have a severe reaction if they accidentally eat peanut. Uh, notice this is decent sensitization. This is not a cure for peanut allergy. The patients still need to carry their epinephrine and avoid peanut, but if they accidentally get peanut, they're much less likely to have a severe reaction. This is the LEAP study. Don't spend any time on this except to point out, as everyone already knows, that in patients who are given peanut at an early age, particularly if they have eczema or egg allergy, which is when they have high risk of peanut allergy, um, if you do that, you decrease the likelihood that they will progress on to developing peanut allergy. So it's really important to encourage early introduction of peanut into these patients. A lot of the parents who bring their child in with rashes from peanut have noticed it after they tried early introduction. And, and I encourage them if it's just a rash to keep giving the peanut because that way it's likely not to progress to a more severe type of reaction. So these are my heuristics. Here we are right at the end. Um, keep these things in mind and you can't go wrong. Um, at least you're less likely to go wrong. Uh, if there are no symptoms following ingestion, the patient does not have food allergy. Check. If the patient or parent suspects that a hidden or unknown food is the cause of their symptoms, it is not a food allergy. Check. Patients with food allergy tell you what the food is and what happened to them. If they don't know, they don't have food allergy. The food has to be eaten to cause anaphylaxis. It's just casual exposure, getting it on your skin or whatever, that never causes anaphylaxis. Check. Four, do not order food panels that contain foods of not concern unless there's a reason to do so. Uh, food panels don't need to be ordered. It's, if there's all these irrelevant foods, it just creates problems. Don't do that, please. The goal of diagnosis is to determine the, the likelihood that it is safe to eat the food. Uh, not to know whether there's what the likelihood is of having any kind of reaction at all. You might get a little bit of a rash. Is a rash bad enough that you have to avoid the food? If it's not that bad, if you don't mind scratching a little bit or having a little flare of your eczema, eat the food if you really like the food. The question is, is it safe to eat the food? Are you going to die from the food? That's the purpose of doing the diagnosis. Food avoidance causes a significant damage to the patient and family's quality of life. Don't tell them to avoid a food unless they really need to avoid a food because it's, it's terrible. Okay, summary. Food allergies are a common complaint in the allergy clinic. We, it's probably the most common thing I see now. The most important test is the history of what happened when the food was eaten. If the food has not been eaten, the probability of reaction is the prevalence of food allergy in that group of patients. A test is done to updust the pre, update the pretest probability of a reaction when a treatment decision is not clear. Uh, to confirm the mechanism of reaction as IgE mediated, to estimate the prognosis, the likelihood the patient will outgrow the food allergy, and to monitor disease activity over time. That's why you do a test. The treatment choices include avoid the food, carry up epinephrine if the risk is high, consider oral immunotherapy for peanut allergy, that's the only one we have it for, uh, perform an oral challenge if you don't know what the risk is and you want more clarity, and introduce the food into the diet if the risk is low. Uh, early introduction of peanut uh, between age five and 11 months can reduce the risk of developing peanut and probably egg allergy as well. And with that, I'm going to stop. I, sorry, this has been more didactic. I usually like it to be more interactive, but Dr. Pena is not here today. So maybe the next time 
will be more interactive, but I hope you learned something from this. And um, do you have any comments or questions? Jay, I'll throw a few quick things out and we'll open it to the audience. We're kind of time limited though. Um, thanks for the practical approach on food allergies. That's um, most needed here. Um, I, I do want to throw out that there, everybody practices a little different. And so if you see something come up with one of your attendings, you know, it's, it's okay to think out of the box and the why and hear the differences and see, do you, do you need to change practice or is there a reason why they do it in a certain way? Uh, I will tell you that the uh, recurrent highs and underlying as you pass the attending, why are we doing it this way? And the, yeah. the attending might give you a just so story. It's very common. That's why I, Rudyard Kipling is very popular. Uh, or they may have a real good valid explanation. You then need to decide, does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. I agree. Um, but individuals with eczema and uh, recurrent hives will search endlessly for the food uh, answer. Um, kind of little pearls. If they are starting to come up with more and more foods every time they visit and more unusual, less likely food allergens, um, Hello? then it's more likely that it's almost none of the foods. <laughs> um, they just have poorly controlled eczema or they have spontaneous highs. Um, so also remember subjective symptoms are always suspect. We want more objective symptoms. So if my belly hurts, I can't prove belly pain. So um, take that um, light. Um, there's a reason um, in, in, in food allergy and percentages of population prevalence and all that, you know, it's, it's relatively low in children will say 3% and adults it's 8%. So it's not uncommon that everybody calls certain food intolerances food allergies that's a nomenclature thing um, too um, if you ever do te testing when you're kind of going i don't think this is going to help your eczema management but sometimes you will find you will be forced to do it here or certain practitioners might i think it's important to have a discussion with the family and a document you note that the limitations of the ige mediated testing or skin testing is for acute symptoms that occur not for long-term management you'll get talked into well they drink milk every day therefore we don't know that it's not causing the eczema but unfortunately you know most of these kids are going to have show sensitization and then you're back to doing a challenge to prove if it's if there's any acute uh, component um, so anyway shared decision medicine uh, decision making when you go into testing and let them know the problems you run into i get i do a lot of food challenges and i get kids that come in with six and seven things on their list um, which can be frustrating and, and costly to go through and then um one of the last things i, I want to discuss and this, this you have to dance around quite carefully with patients and all that but this is more information for you to know in the background not necessarily to share directly with your parents unless you have a great skill to do it the number of deaths from food allergy are reported in the U.S. to be about 150 per year. If it's your child or your loved one, it's everything. The numbers don't matter, right? So I get the reason to be fearful um, and concerned. However, put it in perspective, the number of deaths in the United States from cars is 38,000 a year. All right. So 150 per year versus 38,000. That's quite different. We get in our cars multiple times per day. We do safety things. We wear a seatbelt. Um, we don't talk on the phone, <laughs> right? Um, you know, we hopefully get tires that are good and cars that break well, et cetera. So we do all of our management things just like we do in trying to prevent food allergies. But um, I think it's important to realize that there are a lot of risky things that happen in this world and we still take those relative risks. Um, and what I, I'm, I it kind of hurts when I see the families that are run extremely anxious and nervous. Always be concerned. But I, it, it's not healthy to worry about things that are less common and less likely to occur. Um, so I, I, I read a, a MOC study that I just did recently that um, your risk of, of dying from, uh, if for a child dying from pneumonia is the same risk as dying from a food allergy. And, you know, I bet if you ask your patients, are you worried about your child dying of pneumonia? Yeah, take a look at this, this, uh, this is a um, systematic, you know, uh, in clinical and experimental allergy, the slide that I'm showing, but it puts it in perspective. You're more likely to be murdered in the United States than you are to die of a food allergy reaction if you have peanut allergy. Yep, I agree. Think about I, it. I, I, so I really ter ter being terrified of your food allergy makes no sense, but parents are. They're just, I understand that. Our job is to try to help them put it into more perspective because they probably have no idea. 
So always be concerned. I think it's reasonable to do the things that we recommend and between avoidance all the way to uh, epinephrine and being prepared. But I also want the listening audience to know the, the relative risk um, is small. Again, if it's, if it's your, your loved one, it's everything in the world. But um, and then not to, to sound uncaring, and I realize this will not be popular with uh, some of the people that may listen in, but um, just stating the facts of what we know. So anyway, um, in, the, in the audience, do we have anybody else who has a, a, a quick comment? Well, enjoy treating food allergy and let's hear from Dr. Raji. All right. Thanks, Thanks Jim. Fantastic. We appreciate you being there. Bye bye.